Amen. All right. So if we could throw that first slide up there, uh, we're going to continue on with the series, Partnering with God. And this is going to be the second to the last message in this summer series. And uh, as Mike said, uh, next Wednesday is going to be uh, the last Wednesday morning for our Be Still Bible Study. And uh, also I want to say this, is that you guys don't have to bring any uh, side dishes next Wednesday. The church is going to supply the meal and all of that, so you just need to come and show up. But you do need to call the office and let us know uh, Monday or send you can send me a, a, an email because Alicia is going to be out of town. And you can, send, you can still send her the, the email. She won't be back till Tuesday. But we need to get a head count so we know how much to order for the Bible study. Okay, can you do that? Let me hear you say amen. So let me ask you a question. How many of you are baseball fans or at least familiar with some uh, famous teams or players? How many of you? Yeah, good. Good percentage of you. So one of my favorite players was a man by the name of Reggie Jackson who played 21 years of Major League Baseball, and his nickname was Mr. October. And he got his nickname because he was known to shine when his team played in the postseason playoffs, which are coming up soon. So Reggie would come up to bat, and a lot of times the ball, you could be guaranteed that the ball would go over the home run fence most of the time. He was really a scary threat to the opposing team. Reggie Jackson said in an interview that he lived for the postseason playoffs because that's when he would shine the most. But in order for Reggie Jackson to get to the postseason, he had to get through the long, and it's a long, regular season of baseball. And his secret to shining in the regular season was to keep his eyes on the distant October, the playoff season. And so God is looking for Mr. and Mrs. Octobers, you guys, uh, those type of people who have their eyes on eternity, who faithfully play hard in the regular season because they're looking forward to the postseason in eternity. Can I get somebody to say amen this morning? And so Philippians 3.14, uh, you can go to that slide, please. It is the main text for today's message. And the Apostle Paul says this, he says, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul writes that, the great Apostle Paul. And by the way, the title of today's message is Pressing Towards the Goal. How many of you know we need to press on towards that goal that Paul is talking about? And when I was in high school, and actually my entire childhood, I, I was it was all based around sports. Uh, Little League Baseball, when you get older, you go up to Pony League Baseball, and then American Legion Baseball. And then when I got into high school, I got into wrestling and and track and field and football and all, any kind of sport that w was available, I, I, I got into it. And it just so happened that the high school that I went to was one of the powerhouse football uh, programs back in that day, and that was a while ago. They're not very good anymore. I was very fortunate of that because our high school uh, produced many great athletes, and uh, we received a lot of attention from colleges uh, that recruited from our high school. And so, well, I, I was one of those fortunate young men who, uh, who, who got recruited because I had 11 football scholarship offers, and I decided to go to the University of Utah, and then later I transferred uh, up north to Utah State University. 
And I began to train after my senior year in high school really super hard. I trained hard in high school, but after high school, I trained really hard, spending hours in the weight room and running and, and being the best shape uh, I possibly can for when the season started. And today we live in a culture where a lot of folks don't want to put in the necessary work that's required to obtain the goal. Lazy people. Lots are looking for a free handout or a, a quick fix, right? Wanting to see great results without putting in the work. And unfortunately, this idea has even permeated into the church of today, of our day. A couple of years ago, I started a seven or eight week marriage course called Doing Marriage God's Way. Some of you in here attended that. It required coming to class on Sunday evenings and then uh, during the week sitting down with your spouse for an hour or so, inviting the Holy Spirit to get involved in the homework assignment and that you spend time together uh, answering the questions, uh, communicating with one, one another, allowing the Holy Spirit to have his way in that conversation. There was a young couple that was having marital problems uh, that came to one of the sessions. And I, I, I don't know the severity of their problem at that particular time, but they came to one of the classes, and then they stopped coming. I didn't want uh, to invest the time into their marriage and guess where they're at today, in the middle of a divorce. Didn't want to take the time, didn't want to invest the time, didn't want to try to correct what was going on in their marriage just by attending uh, an hour and a half class on Sunday nights. That would have helped, I believe, because I've, I've seen that same uh, course that I taught and developed help many people whose marriages were in trouble. The Apostle Paul tells us to press on toward the goal for the prize. What does that mean? The Greek word that is used for the English word press, I believe if you go to the next slide, please, is the word dioko. And it means to run after and to catch a person or a thing, to pursue in a hostile manner, and to seek after something eagerly and earnestly in order to acquire it. Dioko, to press on toward the goal for the prize. We, we, we want to get the prize, don't we? We always want to get the prize. You should always want to get the prize. If you just live life and, 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 and wake up every day and meander around and say, oh, look, it's a new day, and you don't press on towards the goal, trying to get the prize at the end of this life, then you're, you're wasting time. So how many of you like eating artichokes? Yeah, I do too. In fact, I just had one the other night. Well, I had one last night with my dinner, and while I was eating it, it made me think about this message that I'm teaching today. When eating an artichoke, you guys know this, you artichoke lovers. Uh, and to get down to the heart of the artichoke, that's the yummiest part, right? Where all the meat is. That's the meat of the artichoke. But getting there, it takes a long time. you got to pull off each leaf and, you know, grind a little bitty teaser taste off the leaf of the artichoke. Man, I don't know how many leaves they have, but it's a lot of leaves, right? So you've got to pull off each leaf to taste the artichoke so it makes you want to pursue getting through all of those leaves in a hostile manner. Like, man, i got to get down pretty soon after you do that for a while. You want to just get right down to the heart, right? So you, you, you kind of do, get it in a hostile manner so that you can get to the meatier part of the artichoke. But it takes a while to get there, right? It takes time to get there. You have to have patience to get there. So when you think about it, walking with God or partnering with God 
is kind of like eating an artichoke in a way. Christianity is developing a relationship with God on this journey that we take with God through life. It's a chance to walk every day depending on Him so that we can, as Paul says in in the second half of Philippians 3.14, he says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Because Paul realized that he had not yet arrived. There was only one option for Paul, that he had to press on. He had to press on through his life, and there was no exit plan, there was no turning back for Paul. When Spain led the world in the 15th century, on her coins were inscribed these words, uh, plus ultra, plus ultra, which meant nothing further, meaning that Spain was the ultimate in all of the world. That's what they were saying that was inscribed on their coins. But interestingly interestingly enough, uh, when the discovery of the new world happened, she realized that she was not the ultimate end, that she was not the prize, and changed the inscription on her coin to plus ultra, meaning more beyond, more beyond. In the same way, some Christians' lives say nothing further. There's nothing further than this. And others say there's more beyond. Are you guys with me on this? This is where childlike faith meets the, the real maturity in our Christian walk. A child can't wait to get bigger, right? We've all raised little kids, most of us have, or have grandkids or whatever. And that little child, for some reason, when we're we're this big. We can't wait to get bigger. Can't wait to become a teenager. We can't wait to be five and start kindergarten. So it's all about growing and maturing with a little child. They always want to mature more and be like an adult. But when Paul said, I press on, that meant that he had put his hands to the plow and refused to look back at his past life. And you good Bible students, remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 62. Jesus said this. He said, no one puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus stressed to the man the commitment it takes to follow him. That's what he was talking about. One must have the determination of a farmer as we walk through this life because it's a long life. And day by day, we need to keep our hands in the plow. We need to look to the future, not turn our heads around and look to our past. Every time I read this verse, it reminds me of my father-in-law who was a big farmer his entire life in Nebraska. And man, I've got to tell you that it takes a lot of determination to get up early in the morning and begin plowing those fields and getting them ready to plant. And then having, after the it's harvest time, and then having to go out and harvest the, the crops. A farmer has to keep his rows straight, you guys, by focusing on an object that's close to the plow or close to the tractor nowadays in front of him, and also focus on something out in the distance so that you can have something to shoot for. So there's something close and something in the distance, and they look at both of those as they're driving the tractor to plow and to keep the road straight. If a farmer started to plow and kept looking around, I ride a motorcycle, and one of the rules is don't turn your head. Because where you turn your head, that's where your bike's going to go. And same thing when you're plowing the field. Same thing when you're following Jesus. Are you guys with me? 
So a farmer keeps his row straight by focusing on an object, one, up, one close and one far out into the distance. He could never make a straight row by turning his head around and looking in back of him and every time something was going on around him, checking it out because it would be crooked. It would be a, called a horrible farmer. Amen? So it's the same for us in our following Jesus. We are to fix our eyes on Jesus, you guys, and keep our eyes on Him, never taking them off of Him. Listen, no farmer ever plowed a straight row looking back over his shoulder. Doesn't happen. Here is something else a plowman had to do back in the day when they plowed uh, with a handheld plow and a horse pulling the plow. They had to hold on. They had to hold on to the plow. A plowman that lets go is no plowman at all. He's going to get fired. He, he's going to starve his family out when he lets go of the plow. Plowmen, uh, plowmen are, 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 are blessed and have a virtue that we Christians of this day must have and that is to hold on and not look back. Paul pressed on to do that. Jesus, to do what Jesus wanted him to do. His efforts were focused on doing God's will and not his own will. And that's what this series is all about. And that's what the Wednesday morning Bible study is all about. It's about not my will be done, but yours, O Lord. Paul pressed on to do what Jesus wanted. Amen? So I've said all that because I want to remind us that real Christianity is a journey. Turn to somebody and say, it's a journey. And it's a chance for us to walk each day in dependence upon our Heavenly Father. That's what it is. That's what this journey is all about, depending on Him to get you through each and every day. And so in the wake of His powerful awakening in our lives and in His transforming power, we must press into a continual surrendering of our hearts, right, to His will. And this involves daily efforts to do so. So when I... When I first received Christ and the power of God's transformation, I, I, I began to realize that I, I had to uh, convince my friends and the group of people that I was hanging out with that back in that day that Jesus was real. He was the real deal. And that He took up residence in my life. Because they, they knew how I was before the day I received him. And now they see this guy that's completely different. And I had to convince them that this was the real deal. That doesn't happen overnight. How many of us understand that? They ha they've watched me for a long time. And then they realized at some point, man, this Amador, is, that's, he's, he's different, man. He's real. This must be true, this Jesus thing. So I refused to participate, you see, in the things that I did with them in the party lifestyle that I once led. And when Shar and I got married, God literally picked us up and He moved us from the beach scene, which I was involved in and, and had been part of and for, for many years. And He picked us up and He moved us to the Inland Empire. I thought, my Lord, have I been that bad that I have to go to the Inland Empire? <laughs> the desert. So as time went on and some of my closest friends saw that this Jesus thing was real, this thing that I experienced was real and that I was not the same guy that I once was. And I began to get phone calls from them uh, telling me they needed help. Sean will testify to that. And I would tell him to meet me at a park in Fullerton, Fullerton Park, 
which was close to where we, we lived at, at that particular time. We lived in Brea Olinda Village and uh, in Brea and, uh, and, Fuller, and I worked in Fullerton. So Fullerton Park was kind of a middle ground for us to meet in. And so I say, hey, meet me in Fullerton Park at this time at such and such place by the lake. And in that park, I, I got to tell you guys, the Holy Spirit showed up as I shared my testimony with them. And some of them got saved right there on the spot and stayed saved to this day. Some of them said the prayer, but they didn't stay saved. How many of you know what I'm talking about? They went right back to their old ways. They shed a few tears and thanked me, but they went right back to their old lifestyle. But some of them stayed saved, even to, to now, praise God. They saw the dramatic change in me. And others began to want what I had, and what I had to give them was Jesus. It was nothing, it wasn't about me. But they saw the change in me. Are you guys with me? Amen. The same power that delivered me from the bondage of Satan also took hold of them and set them free right in front of my eyes. Powerful. Because I knew these guys. I used to hang out with them. One of them, who now lives in Michigan, sends me a Christmas card every year thanking me for introducing him to Jesus. Every year, he thanks me. And many times, he calls me and thanks me for that. I talked to him on the phone one time. He was having a problem with his current fiance, and they, they kind of broke up. And she lived out in Palm Springs, and he lived down in the be at the beach. And uh, she moved in with her mother, who lived in Palm Springs, and he would drive out there because he was his heart was broken because she broke up with him. And so he would drive out there just to cruise around by her house to to see if maybe there was another guy's car there or not, right? And it was driving him crazy. Some of you guys, I know you did this in your lifetime too, right? Uh, anyway, he, he drove around her house all the way from the beach to Palm Springs a couple times a week. Get off work and just drive out there. Make sure she was at home with her mom. So one time, he drove, he, he calls me and says, man, I'm going through all this stuff. Now, he had already received Christ. This is a guy in Michigan that I'm talking about. Maybe he's watching right now. And uh, he, he called me and said, hey, this is what's going on. He told me the story about how broken he was and this and that. And uh, I said, look, man, you just got to let God do his thing. And so anyway, he couldn't do that. So he drives out there one day and apparently he had a key to the house and there was nobody home. And he went, he goes in the house and he's walking around the house and he sees a stack of pictures on the kitchen sink. And so he starts thumbing through the pictures and he sees a picture of the girl's mom and this guy and his girlfriend. There, I got their arm, you know, like. And then he sees a couple of pictures of just him and this girl, the guy and, this, and his girlfriend. And he's mad. He's like broken. He's like upset. He's really hurt. And he gets in his car and he starts driving back. And he, this is his story. He tells me he gets somewhere around, in, somewhere in the Inland, Inland Empire, and he pulls off the road and he goes into this restaurant and there's a, a bar in the restaurant. And so he walks up to the bar and he sits down next to this guy and he, and he orders a beer. And he's sitting there and he's having a beer and he turns and he, he looks to his right and the guy he's sitting next to is the guy that was in the picture <laughs> with his arm around his girlfriend. And he, he looks at the guy, and he, he's, he's starting to get upset, right? But he says, hey, you, you wouldn't happen to know this girl and her mom. They live out in Palm Springs. She goes, oh, yeah, know them really well. I grew up with them. We're like 
my mom and her mom are best friends, and, and uh, you know, we've been friends our entire life, and blah, 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 blah. And he, my friend says, well, is, are, is, is she your girlfriend? Oh, no, no, I have, my, I have a girlfriend. She's just a friend. And I was just out there to see them a few days ago. And so God revealed to him. So this is like just a few days after I led him to the Lord. And one of the things I prayed was, God, show him, reveal yourself to him some way. And that's how God did it. And he, after he left that bar, he called, he says, remember what you prayed? And I, I really didn't. I said, he said, you, you said, God, reveal yourself to Ted, that's his name, some way so he knows that you're real. And he said, can you believe that? Out of all the places that I, I could have pulled into, I pulled into this place and there's an empty chair and I walk up to the thing and it's, it's the guy that's in the picture. God revealed himself to show that he was real to him so that he would have peace and trust God. That's an amazing story. Amen? That's the miracle of a changed life. And now we have to continue to clean this house, right? We need to keep our house clean. And I'm not talking about pulling out the vacuum cleaner and the dust rag. I'm talking about cleaning our spiritual house. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, if we can go there. It says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Now listen very carefully. Once you've been delivered and set free... You must keep the temple clean, you guys. And you do that by getting rid of old old habits back here that you had and picked up along the way and ungodly attachments that you have. And when things get tough and you grab hold of that plow, you grab it tighter and tighter, tighter, and you don't look back. Are you guys with me? Let me hear you say amen this morning. Now I'm going again to the original text that I began with, and I, I want to expound on what the great Apostle Paul was saying here. So let's, let's read Philippians 3, and we're going to look at verses 13 and 14. And here's what Paul writes. He says, Brothers, I do not... Con you, you can put sisters in there too. I don't want to leave anybody out. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining or pressing forward to do what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. When we look at this passage of Scripture, we must take uh, uh, into account that he, what he was saying in the previous passages of Scripture. You can't just look at those uh, uh, passages and, and get an, a full, complete idea of what he was saying. So we have to look at the previous passage of Scripture because he first speaks of his great accomplishments that he made, speaking of things that he had achieved. So let's look at them as he mentioned them to, mentions them in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. He says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, uh, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more confidence. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So he says all these accomplishments, he lists them, that, he, that I have achieved, he says, in my Jewish culture, in my Jewish life. And now I see them from a different light, is what he's saying. I, I can see that in Christ, they are, they're meaningless. All those accomplishments are meaningless. And he moves on to verse 7. 
through 11, and, and he continues his thought. And here's what he says. He says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as what? Rubbish. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Mr. October that he may attain the resurrection from the dead. That doesn't happen until after this life, my friends. In other words, therefore, I consider these accomplishments, Paul says, as rubbish so that I might gain Christ. In other words, he realizes that he has not gotten to be where he should be yet. There's a, there's a lot of stuff that he has to, to learn, and there's a lot of purging in his heart. There's a lot of house cleaning that needs to take place. Are you with me, guys? He's not yet what he was called to be, what God called him to be. And I really love verse 11, because it says this. It says, that by any means possible... I may attain the resurrection from the dead. By any means, he's get, whatever it takes, man, I am, this is my goal, this is where my focus is, that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. I want to be with Jesus for eternity. So all this rubbish, all this stuff that I gained in my past life, all these failures that took place in my past life, they're, they're rubbish. And my focus is set on heaven. My focus is set on on the resurrection from the dead, so that I could be with my Lord for eternity. Hallelujah. Can somebody praise the Lord this morning? Paul wasn't this morbid thinking guy that loved to suffer. He didn't, he didn't like suffering through life. He didn't like having to go through all the trials and tribulations that he went through. He wasn't doubting his salvation but in his life, he realized and he made it his goal to do whatever it took to live the resurrection life right now. And you and I need to make the same choice. The resurrection life is a life of power. And we all need to make that choice that we're going to live the resurrection life right now. And the ultimate goal of the resurrection life is the resurrection from the dead. That by any means possible, Paul says, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Hallelujah. Come on, church, let me hear you say hallelujah this morning. Remember, Paul wrote this having experienced more suffering than any of us have ever experienced. And he wrote it while under the, under, being under house arrest, arrest with Roman soldiers always watching over him. This wasn't a theological theory that he came up with. He was writing about he was writing about himself. He actually lived this out. Therefore he's qualified. Verses twelve through fifteen, let's read those together. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward for what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way.
Can we do that? Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God re- re- will reveal that also to you. So one thing we all need to do as we press toward the goal is to forget, now listen to me, is to forget those things from behind, those things behind us, those things that have already passed. We need to forget about them. Amen? Amen. From our past, because they can hang us up, you guys. And, And we never move forward in Christ if we allow that to happen. So forget about them. My grandma used to, little Italian grandma said, forget about it. Kiss it up to God. That's what she would say. Turn to the person next to you and say, forget about it. Forget about those things behind. And then Paul goes on to say this. He says, I strive, I push, I pray toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Wow. Most of the time when we talk about forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forward for that goal, usually we think about these negative things that have happened in our, in our lives, right? The challenges the, that we've had, and, and we say forget those, and we keep pushing forward. The bad things that happen, the negative things, we say forget them. I'm, I'm going to try to forget those and I'm, going to, I'm just going to push forward. And yes, we, we need to do that. We need to not stay stuck in our failings from the past. But as I pondered on these verses, I realized that we can also get stuck in our successes also. Always talking and bragging about our past accomplishments. Any of you know people that do that? And that, too, can prevent us from moving forward, you guys. You know, like Peter was on the Mount of Transfiguration, and Peter decided that he didn't want to go any further than that. Lord, let's build three tabernacles, he said. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Let's stay right here and not move. That was Peter's thought process. Of course, the Lord said, no, we've got lots of work to do. It's easy to get stuck in our past, you guys, whether it be successes or failures. It's easy to get stuck in them 20, 30 years behind us, down the road, and we still talk about them, whether good or bad. And I don't mean just telling someone a story from our past. I mean being stuck there. I remember going to a high school reunion not that long ago. Well, it was a few years ago because most half of them are dead now. (laughs) Anyway, but I went to this high school reunion and it's like uh, some of them had the exact same hairdo that they had in high school. Some of the girls had their beehive hairdo. And some of the guys had their pompadour combed back. They were stuck in their past. Being stuck isn't a good place to be. And I I told you the story. I'm not going to repeat it where where I was falling. And and when I hit ground, I I was stuck in this thick tar, right? I I told it not that long ago. Being stuck is not a fun place to be. It's it's not easy to get out of it. You've experienced these things in your past, but you have yet attained what God wants you to attain. Not yet gotten to the place where you're called to be, where God called you and He wants you to get to. You haven't got there yet. You haven't attained it yet. Now listen, your past, whether it be the failures or the accomplishments, should be stepping stones for your future. That's what they're supposed to be. 
not to be stuck there and live in that place. You use them, them to become wiser. And what I mean by that is that you realize your future success can only be accomplished in Jesus Christ. Not in whatever you did back then. Paul said in verse 13, he says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Your failures and your achievements of yesterday are yesterday's failures and achievements, right? There's still today. And there's still tomorrow to come. So the Greek word uh, used for forgetting in that passage of Scripture actually means to put, put it out of our mind. That's what it means. It means you remove it from the forefront of your mind. Because it's always there. It's always reminding you. It's stuck there. And you remove it from the forefront of your mind. And you push it way back into the crevices of your mind. Back here somewhere where you never think about it anymore. That's no longer what I'm going to focus on, you say. I did that in times past. But now, I have more to do. I have more to do for Jesus. Because the resurrection of the dead is coming. And I want to be in that. I want to be with Jesus for eternity. Amen. Remember Reggie Jackson's secret was to keep his eyes on October. Right? And your and mine should be to keep our eyes on Jesus. That we may attain the resurrection from the dead. Praise God. That's my message today. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word that it is true, that it is alive. And Father God, we thank you that you are the one that is able to set the captives free. Lord, we, everybody here, I want you to take active participation in this prayer. Say this after me, Father, I give you permission to enter into my mind, enter into my heart, and to take possession of me, and especially those thoughts of my past, whether it be thoughts of success, that I continue to brag about things that I did, or thoughts of failures and negative. I ask you to remove them. Help me shove them way back, forgetting those things that I might press forward to attain the resurrection of the dead. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for reminding me when that happens. And I take active charge over those things now in Jesus' name. And everybody said,